Hey, girl, you want some internet? Um, I don't know. I can hook you up. I got a $200 gift card for AT&T Fiber. Everybody's on it. I think I'll pass, but thank you. Oh, come on. I can sweeten the deal. 300 bucks. That could pay for your first couple of months. No, thank you. Oh, come on. I own every politician. No matter where you go, I'm always going to have internet everywhere. All right, then. Be like that. Hello and welcome back. So I hope you guys enjoyed that introductory video because today we're going to talk about, or tonight, whatever, whatever you have, we're going to talk about AT&T, internet, fiber, and the Unify setup that I have going on. So recently, well kind of recently, about three months ago, I switched over to AT&T fiber, not by choice, but mostly because they were, of course, the only available ISP in my area. And so far, I've got to admit, I'm pretty surprised with AT&T Fiber's service, especially when compared to Google Fiber, which is recently what I switched from. Now, this video is not intended to be a comparison video between AT&T Fiber and Google Fiber, but I will touch on some things and differences between the two and my experience between the two, but only a little bit. So without any further waiting, let's go ahead and check out what it's like to be on AT&T Fiber. Signing up for AT&T Internet was pretty straightforward. I plugged in my zip code. They showed me all the list of options available in my area. I picked my plan, created my account, scheduled time for a technician to come out, and that was pretty much it. A few days later, technician came out and decided that he would in fact run his own fiber from the street to the house, even though there was an existing line. And he went ahead and did me the courtesy of cutting the previous line that was there and leaving everything just dangling out in my yard. Thankfully, my house already has fiber run from the outside to the inside, so all the technician had to do was simply connect both strands together and then connect the ONT on the inside of the house, and the ONT is responsible for converting that fiber signal over to a copper signal, and the copper signal then gets carried over to the gateway that they provide for $10 a month, mind you, on top of your bill, by the way. And that is basically where you get your phones, broadband, your routing and as well as your access point. So the gateway is pretty critical, at least according to AT&T. Now, if you choose to forego using the AT&T gateway, they still will charge you $10 a month. And by the way, if you speak to someone at customer service, they are insistent on that you cannot have service without that gateway. And they say, even if you choose not to use it, like I plan to, they will still charge you the $10 a month anyway, even if you return it to them because you can't use their service without it, which we all know isn't exactly true. So let's talk about the ONT, but before we get into too many details about the AT&T ONT, let's first talk about the Google Fiber Fiber Jack or their ONT. So their Fiber Jack is responsible for basically the same thing as taking a fiber connection and converting it over to an ethernet connection, but also it acts as their wireless access point. And anytime you wanna make changes to your account, Google sends a signal to your fiber jack and they automatically basically update that thing, whether it be Wi-Fi changes or speed or connection changes to, to your internet. And then it just updates right there on the, on the fly. It's a little slow, but it works for most cases. Now this ONT from AT&T, its only job is to convert that signal. And as far as I can tell, not much else. AT&T's gateway is kind of magical in the sense that it also is responsible for running an authentication service to verify that you do in fact have service with AT&T and that's basically how AT&T supposedly checks to make sure that your account is valid with them, which doesn't really make a lot of sense, but whatever lies that they decide to spread, which are probably definitely not true, and the reason why I say probably definitely not is because we do know in fact that the USG is capable of replicating the authentication processes that happen within the AT&T gateway to give you internet and thus allowing you to move the gateway completely out of your network. However, that is not something I did because one, I'm lazy. The steps to do that seemed very daunting and I didn't really want to mess with my already set up network to run a service that I'm not really sure how it even operates in the first place. And it just kind of scared me. So that brings us into the next part. Well, how do you use AT&T's gateway, but also your own equipment? Now what's really cool and not the same on all models, but my specific model allows for something called IP pass through and some other models call it bridging, but I don't believe that's the right word. Uh, you can also do some things with DMZ, but I wasn't really gonna do any of that. I was just gonna play around with IP pass-through. 
And what's really neat about IP pass through is basically that you can tell the gateway, hey, any of the WAN traffic, just pass that WAN IP straight to, in my case, the USG. And now the USG can see the WAN IP and all traffic is essentially routed directly to the USG, which is great. Now there are mixed reports that that process that happens slows down the connection significantly, but that's not something I've seen, thankfully. My service so far with AT&T has actually been pretty stellar, even though they're a really shady company. But I haven't had to do with their customer service yet, and I've heard lots of horror stories about their customer service, so thankfully we haven't had to deal with that just yet. All this talking is really taking it out of me. AT&T service is pretty good. Now I'm going to show you a bunch of different graphs of some of the speeds I've had uh, with their service since I've had it for the last three months, and honestly it's always been over 800 megabits per second, and up and down by the way and there really isn't much to complain about. Now, there are some points of contention, and the first one being that originally when I wanted to sign up for their service, they were offering 300 megabits per second up and 100 megabits per second down for 79, no, I'm sorry, for 69.99 plus the $10 rental fee, and thankfully they decided to waive the $75 installation fee for new customers, which doesn't really make sense because if you want to get new customers, why charge a fee anyway? Google doesn't do it. And by the way, their service is $70 a month in my area, $70 a month for a gigabit up and down. Okay, great. And oh, by the way, there's no rental fees. Anyway, so that was the original offer. And a few weeks or the day of, of when I was writing my blog post about AT&T service, they actually change their rates for the better, surprisingly, but they still charge you the $10 fee. So what's really cool about AT&T is if they do come out with a new offer, you don't even have to call and ask somebody for the new offer. You can just go online, select the $49.99 a month for their gigabit up and down, which also, by the way, removes the terabyte cap that they have per month. And your account has those changes reflected pretty much within the first 30 minutes of selecting it. Now, in some cases, it may take them longer to actually tell you, hey, by the way, you have this new service. But from what I've seen, it was pretty much instantaneous as far as the network speeds go and the account changes that I made to have full gigabit up and down. However, here's the real kicker. So it's not actually $49.99 a month. That's only for new customers. I'm not a new customer. I've had my service for about three weeks. Well, then I had my service for about three weeks. It's been about four months now. Anyway. So that's for new customers. So what they do is instead of giving you the promotional rate, they just go ahead and charge you for their true rate after the promotional period, which actually turns out to be $69.99, which is not something they really show you until it comes time to pay your bill. I mean, you can see the changes happen. So technically they do show you, it just takes a lot more time than the service adjustment. Now, it's really hard for me to complain about $69.99 a month because I was already paying Google $70 a month before I moved, and that's pretty close. But realistically, I'm paying $80 a month because of the $10 rental fee. So I'm not entirely upset about all of that. It would just been nice to know, or nice if they would have just shown you what existing customers would have gotten instead of trying to market me, hey, we have this new offering for $49.99 a month. And oh, by the way, if you're a new customer, if you actually call them on the phone, you can turn that $200 gift card that they try to offer you into $300, which is pretty neat. You know, come try our drugs. That way you get hooked to our service and you're basically stuck, even though you're probably stuck anyway because they literally have a monopoly on the market. Ugh, it's so, ugh, it just makes me so angry sometimes. At the end of the day, I kind of feel like I'm doing business with the devil because AT&T has this like really bad reputation known for screwing over customers and employees of the like. When I was living in Orlando, I actually got to see strikes from employees happening at the AT&T building that was there. I mean, those people were out there almost daily. And by the way, this was in summer in Orlando, Florida, which if you don't know, one, it's extremely hot, and two, the humidity is killer. And these poor people were out there protesting daily, weeks, months apart, all of the time. So yeah, at and is not exactly a company you want scratching your back every now and again but honestly their service is good it's literally like that good i don't want to give it up but that being said if google did come back to my area i would probably switch despite some of my negative 
experiences with Google. Not negative in a necessarily bad way, but I did have a lot of issues where sometimes connecting to YouTube and other sites just took forever to load, which didn't really make sense because you'd think, well, you know, YouTube being part of Google, it would load as fast as molasses. <laughs> not literally. But it was not consistent. Like the service was really good sometimes and then really poor other times. at and on the other hand, it's been so good, I totally forgot that I was supposed to be checking for inconsistencies over the last three or four months since I've had their service. It's been fa fantastic. Low latency, except when connecting to servers outside of the East Coast and most of the West Coast servers, but that's probably not AT&T's fault. That's more than likely the ISP of the owning company for that those servers that I'm connecting to. And also the bandwidth has been very, very consistent, which has been great for uploading YouTube videos because oftentimes if I have a 32 gigabyte file, it can take 15 minutes to upload to YouTube, which isn't very bad at all. And I'm very thankful for. But again, if Google comes back, I'll probably go and crawling back to Google and who knows how they'll rake me over the coals when I go to break my contract with them. Wait, am I even in a contract? Huh. Well, anyway, guys, I want to thank you all for watching. I highly recommend checking out my blog post about AT&T if you want to know any more information. And I probably missed a few things, to be honest. But I would go check it out anyway. And in the meantime, I'm going to go watch HBO Max, complimentary of at and service. I'm not actually shilling for AT&T, but I felt obligated to say that. So, peace out, A-Town down.